Christina McKelvey, followed by Alison Harris. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. We've spoken a lot this afternoon about fairness, and to be fair, fairness is an idea that's challenging to pin down. But we all know roughly what it means when we use the word in everyday context, yet it can mean everything or nothing. For most of us, our first idea of fairness was in the school playground, as we heard Jenny Gilruth speaking about in her remarks, or at home with our brothers and sisters. Nothing was ever fair in my house, I have to say. A childish, naive idea of fairness, yet absolutely at the nub of it, because fairness does not discriminate between people on the basis of their gender, their religion, their age, their ability or disability, their race or their social background. It's not the same as treating everyone exactly the same. We know that. So what does fairness mean in the governance and makeup of social policy? How can we ensure that we, what, we, what we plan for Scotland and our new social security bill and our poverty bill and all of the other pieces of legislation that flow through this place, how can we ensure that it's fair? Well, we can learn from current situations that we already live in. Presiding officer, last week I had the opportunity to see Ken Loach's new film, I, Daniel Blake. I watched it last week with my son and it devastated both of us. It devastated the entire cinema and as I believe is devastating audiences across the whole of the UK. It's harsh, it's brutal, it's cruel. The unfairness of the UK benefit system is all too familiar to me and to many of my constituents, the Daniel and Danielle Blakes who come through my door. We see it every day, the real meaning of social deprivation. And Loach isn't trying to put out some objective documentary, no. The film is based on interviews with real people in real situations, then portrayed in the demeaning, unhelpful and yes, unfair treatment of a middle-aged widower who has just had a near fatal heart attack. His doctor tells him to rest. He's not fit for work. The job centre tells him to find a job. Now, that's what I call unfair. In that film, Daniel Blake asked to just be recognised as a citizen, nothing more and nothing less. And if we filter every piece of legislation we do through this parliament through a human rights prism, then we should be treating every citizen as nothing more and nothing less. That's what I call fairness. And a lot, if not every one of us in this chamber, will have seen the impact of Westminster austerity upon the lives of people in our communities and our families. I don't have to think for too long. There's a lady who suffers from extreme agoraphobia who hasn't been able to get out of a 10th floor flat for a year now. The job centre has told her she's physically perfectly fit to work and to find a job. There is an elderly gentleman who has a whole case file with a series of difficult medical problems. He's been told he's fit for work. There's a single mother with two young children, one of whom is very disabled and needs a lot of complex medical kit at home. Because she used a small extra bedroom to keep it in, she was hit by the bedroom tax, thankfully mitigated by this government and hopefully abolished very, very soon. But, presiding officer, it's not all misery, doom and gloom. Scotland's own government, this government, is moving to a position where it will have the power to change, really change, the punitive and outdated welfare system that puts in its place something innovative and effective, an action plan for a fairer Scotland. And we've heard a lot about that, and we hear a lot about action plans and what they should do. But we get an opportunity in this place to work together to achieve that fairer Scotland in that action plan. And it really is about action, as we've heard Alison um, Johnson mentioned earlier, it's great having an action plan, but it has to actually take some action. And I'm proud to see that there's 50 concrete actions set out in the consultation and some 15 or so stakeholder groups and organisations involved in that. These targets are ambitious and they will have a real impact. Yeah. Graeme Simpson. Christina McKelvey. Um, Christine McKelvey has uh, uh, complained a lot in this chamber and again today uh, about things she doesn't like in the benefit system. She's uh, very good at highlighting cases. Uh, can she tell us um, specifically what she would do now that this uh, place is getting new powers? What would she do to change things? I'd be absolutely delighted to move on to that in a few moments. 
As I said, it will take time to see the effect filter through, and I would wish to see that filter through, changing long-term assumptions and cutting through the, the tide of cynicism that has increased so dramatically with the Tory government at Westminster. It isn't going to be easy, I understand that. Now, moving on to some areas that I think an action that the government could take, there is three things that I'd like the Scottish Government to consider on the impact of poverty, and that is the impact of poverty on carers and some of the issues that have arisen with some of the carers I've spoken through the, the uh, consultation on social security and I've raised these with the minister and she's taken those on board and hopefully we can move forward. We also need to change the rhetoric and the record of the Tory government on child poverty. We've heard so much about that today. These young people aren't shirkers. They're not spongers. They're young people who deserve the support and the nurturing from a government that cares about them and their future. That's one action that we could take. But if there is something that I would personally hope the Scottish Government addresses is the challenge faced by those diagnosed with motor neuron disease. I have long spoken about the effects of motor neuron disease in this chamber and not only in this chamber, this has been a lifelong campaign for me. So I would ask the Scottish Government to use that courage, the courage that the Cabinet Secretary spoke about in her open remarks, the courage I believe that she has, that when drafting the new Social Security Bill, that she thinks about fast-tracking motor neuron disease sufferers through that system give automatic entitlement to PIP and attendance allowance, and no, please, no continual reassessment. Imagine, if you will, diagnosed with motor neuron disease, told that your average life expectancy is 14 months, and you spend 10 of those months fighting a system to get a couple extra quid a week. We can change that. We can make a huge difference. You're talking about 340 people per year in Scotland. It's not a huge amount. So I think together, and working together, we can go with the campaign that MND Scotland has launched this, to this day, that let's get benefits right for people with MND. And if we can get it right for people with MND, we can get it right and start getting it right for other people who depend on social security. This government, this Scottish government, has not shirked its responsibilities. We know and understand why we need to get this right, and because we talk to the people on the front line, we know how they feel. The consultation on social security in Scotland closes this weekend, presiding officer, and is providing us with a vast amount of input from individuals trying to work in the system, as well as the larger charities and lobbying bodies who will want to see change. We can do that, presiding officer. We will do it, and with the support of our partners and our colleagues across this chamber and the commitment from everyone, we will see that fairer Scotland, not just for people with motor neuron disease, but for everyone who depends on the state to support them in times of extremity. Thank you. Um, it's good